Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. It's been a rich blessing already. Amen. We've had an investiture for our Adventurer Club and our Pathfinder Club. We've heard a wonderful children's story, and it's wonderful to have the Moxley family join us. John and Precious and family, I, I'm getting to know you all, and uh, we're so glad that you joined us. And uh, we hope that it is, this becomes your home church for years to come. The Lord bless you. I know that we're all part of the Advent movement. Amen. You never quite know where the Lord's going to send you, but for the time he sent you here, let's enjoy it. Amen. All right, dear ones, I'm excited. Not just the Moxley family. I want to invite, there's another family that is joining us. And how many of you enjoyed the piano music last week? Did anybody notice who was playing the piano last week? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, by the way, Philip. Organ is sounding beautiful. Thank you, brother. Piano sounds beautiful. We're so blessed to have Philip. And uh, I want to invite Timko, Vitali, and Lydia and family. Um, this is a precious family. Are you here today? Come on up. Come on up. I want to introduce you. And yep, yeah, come on up. Timko and Vitali and Lydia and family. You know, I'm an adoptive parent. And we adopted and we love doing it. But this precious family didn't just adopt one. You have adopted three children. Is that correct? Three from Ukraine. Correct? From an orphanage in Ukraine. Four. Four from an orphanage in Ukraine. Can we put our hands together? Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Now, I'm going to see if this, we can get this mic to work. And let's see. If you could all just share your names. I know this is super uncomfortable, but don't blame me. Blame my brother right here. He, he planned this all. <laughs> so, Vitaly, you've been playing piano for how long? Only 25 years. Awesome. Well, we hope you play for 25 years here. Amen? <laughs> and, and so we have Vitaly, and what is your name? Lydia, and what is your name? Belanika. Oh, Belanika? Belanika. Belanika, beautiful. What is your name? Yura. Yura? Oh, that's beautiful. And what's your name? Daya. Daya, beautiful. Kostya. Kostya. And that's handsome. Excellent. All right. Well, I just want to say, folks, sometimes you don't realize that there's new families coming in, and we have the Moxley family of other families, and we actually have this family. And I just want you to be able to take a look at them, get to know them. They have a beautiful family, and they have adopted four from an orphanage in Ukraine. And we're so grateful that they are here. Amen? Yeah. Could, I have, could I have a word of prayer for your family? Let me pray for you. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, for all the families in this church, but especially this family. They've traveled so far, and these children have traveled so far to be a part of our church family here in Port Charlotte. Lord, you're an amazing God, and you open doors that no man can close, and you close doors that no man can open. And to have them on this platform today tells me that your spirit has been leading in their lives. Thy will be done. May every blessing from heaven be theirs. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you. All right? Well, happy Sabbath. Now every new family that's in the congregation is quaking in their shoes. Oh, no, we're going to get called up. You might. You just might. <laughs> All right. Thank you, brother. Okay, dear ones, how many of you are eager to hear from God's word? I am too. How, let's, let's do this. It's 12 o'clock. I'm going to do my best to finish by 1230. But if the spirit is moving, if the spirit is moving, and we go a little further, if God wants to teach you something, are you here to learn? I tell you what, God can do more for us in five minutes than I can do for you in 50 years. And if he wants to do that today, then I'm going to let him. Amen? Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we're eagerly wanting to understand your word. We've been studying through the book of John. And Lord, even if we were to go over it again and again and again, we can still glean more from it. Your word is powerful. It's limitless. I pray that you'd plant it in our hearts and our minds. Father, forgive us of all of our sins. May both for the speaker and for the listeners, Lord, may your spirit be able to have full control so that we don't quickly forget the message we've learned this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How many of you would say you're people of great faith? How many people would, I mean, you don't have to raise your hands, but would you say you're people of great faith? You know, the Bible says the faith even as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. Amen. I learned a long time ago that it's not the measure of faith in you. It's the measure of faith you put in Jesus that matters. Amen. Some of us are great, have great faith in our cell phones, right? We've, these things lead and guide our lives. They tell us where we're headed. Some of us, you know, we put faith in all kinds of things. 
But I would suggest putting your faith in Jesus Christ is the most rewarding thing you can do with your faith. You know, when I was a little younger and um, I felt God's call in my life, I've never had, I can tell you the truth, I've never had the kind of faith where I can see the next 10 steps. Maybe you can relate. How many of you know the next 10 steps for your life? Anybody? Anybody know the next 10 steps for your life? I've never had the kind of faith where I can see three or four moves ahead. But I've always had just enough faith to step out on the next step. And then the next step. Amen? Like, for example, when I was, uh, when I was thinking about studying theology and I felt like God was calling me, um, my faith wavered. But every morning around 4 o'clock California time, I got a call from a professor from, at Southern um, by, Phillips, by the name of Philip Saman, and Dr. Saman would call me, and I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in California, he's out in Tennessee, and he'd call me, must have called me first thing in the morning after he talked to Jesus, but it was 4 o'clock, o'clock, o'clock my time in California, and he said, is this Ben Shirtliff? And I said, yes. I'm like, yes, yes. This is Dr. Philip Saman, and I believe God is calling you to study at Southern. And he would call me randomly throughout the summer. My faith wasn't very big. I needed to have a doctor of theology called me throughout the summer to say yes, amen. And then when I went to Southern, I, I, uh, I, my faith was a little wavering. I, I, I went the first year, I went the second year, I went the third year. And there were signs that God was leading. But by the time I went to graduate, not only, by the way, if God is calling you, he'll pave the way, amen. And if you're in the center of his will, the will, for, you're his will for your life, I don't believe he just paves the way. I believe he pays the way. When I graduated from Southern, I was one of the few students that graduated debt-free. Partly thankful, thank, thanks be to God for godly parents, for opportunities to work, but, but honestly, it was the favor of the Lord. When you're in the, on the path God has for you, he provides, amen? And so uh, even then at Southern, when I was about to graduate, I was like, Lord, I felt like you were calling me to study at Southern, but you know, I, there's a lot, there's a big class, and, and I've heard things about the economy. I understand if you don't want to hire me. Uh, thank you for this theology degree, but but maybe you won't hire me. I wasn't the top student. I wasn't the top candidate. They rated us candidates. I was somewhere in the middle. And I'm not saying this to brag, but God was like, Ben, when I call you, I call you, and I'm going to make you known. And I was the first one hired in my class. It was by the Florida Conference. And when I went and ran downstairs to one of my major professors, Dr. Uh, Dr. Edwin Reynolds, I ran into his office. I said, Dr. Reynolds, I've been offered a call to go to, to Florida. And he goes, well, they don't always follow our suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, praise God anyway, amen? <laughs> praise God anyway. By the way, I love Dr. Reynolds. He's so dry, so, so honest. I love him. Um, more stories on that later. And then when I went to study at seminary, I was with Tria. We were married at this point. I went to the seminary, and I finished my, my time at the seminary. It was a blessing. But, but I didn't have enough faith to see even the next step. I mean, I, I knew that we would graduate here, but when I was graduating, it was 2008, 2009. Anybody remember what was going on in the economy and 2008 and 2009. If you were in the uh, construction business, you were out of work. If you were in any kind of, uh, the entire economy kind of crashed around us, right? The housing, in fact, here in Florida, and people may not remember this or people may not know this, but the Florida conference let go of like 30 or 40 pastors right before I was graduating from the seminary. And I thought to myself, man, Lord, what a time to graduate from the seminary to find a job in Florida. I thought for sure I wouldn't get a job. And so Tree and I, we were supposed to interview, and we hopped on a plane, or we went to Chicago, and we hopped on this, or we were about to hop on this plane. We're in the the, the concourse, about ready to board a plane to interview in Florida. And in my heart, I felt, God, thank you for Southern. Thank you for Andrews. But even now, if it's not your will that I pastor, I'm willing to just say thank you for this education and I'll, I'll use it as a doctor. I'll use it as this. I'll use it as that. I'll be a better person because of it. And God was like, Ben, <laughs> haven't I shown you already? If I've made my will known to you, I'll, I guess I need to reaffirm it. So Tree and I are in the, the, the uh, concourse waiting at the gate. And for the first time in my life, this has never happened before, we uh, were upgraded to first class. Anybody ever been upgraded to first class without paying for it? Without paying for it? Well, I, I tell you what, I can only relate one time. And the lady called me up, and we were just randomly, we were sitting there at the gate, and the lady called me up and said, Sir, sir, you, sir, come up here. She pulled me out of a crowd. She goes, she goes give me your tickets. I gave her my tickets, she, and she gave me these two tickets, and she goes, You've been complimentarily upgraded to first class. Please enjoy your flight. And I'm like, 
my name's Ben Shirtlip. Are you sure you're meaning to do this, right? I mean, I, I'd never known that, you know, you get towels and free drinks and the food is free. I mean, the first class is nice. Pause there. Let's go to the Word of God. If you, like me, have struggled having enough faith, maybe just enough faith for the next step, you're the kind of people God wants to work with. Amen? Come with me to the Bible. John chapter 6. We're going to go to John chapter 6, and the Bible says, After these things, verse 1, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. By the way, Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar, this just shows the influence that Rome had in the place where Jesus called home. That was not the, the, the Sea of Galilee is the Sea of Galilee, but, but Rome made its influence felt. There were temples being built in Judea to, to uh, the pagan gods of Rome as well as the emperor worship. And they renamed the Sea of Galilee, the very same sea that Jesus walked across. They renamed it after one of the Caesars, the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him. I see a multitude before me today following Jesus. Isn't that awesome? God is so good. Look around, church. There's more of us than there was just a little while ago. Praise our God. Because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. So the great multitude had heard about these miracles. They'd seen the miracles for themselves. Maybe it was their nephew, their cousin, their aunt. Someone was healed, and they wanted to see Jesus for themselves. And so they, they, they crowded around Jesus right here outside of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his, what? Disciples. Jesus went up on the mountain, don't forget that, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Why does the Bible include that detail? Well, Jews, good Jews, were required, required to attend these feasts and these Passovers, or these, uh, these special festivals, at least four, four main uh, festivals, and in Jerusalem, not just where they lived. They needed to travel to Jerusalem. And so if the Passover, the feast of the Jews was near, people, how many of you have tried to get a uh, hotel uh, the weekend of like 4th of July? On the, like a day before. Tree and I were married July 2nd. We get fireworks every anniversary. But if we don't book a hotel in advance, we don't go far. <laughs> right? The same is true. There, there, was, there are people, the Passover is near. So all the people in, in the, the, the God-fearing Jews in, in Jerusalem and surrounding areas are traveling there. And so the crowd's already swelling because of the Passover being so near. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, I know this is interesting. What do we know about Philip? I wasn't able to, to do as much study on Philip in this particular sermon as I'd like, but the story that comes to mind is, remember Philip was the man who met with the Ethiopian and who baptized him on the road? And if I'm not mistaken, the Bible tells us Philip may be the only man that's ever teleported on earth, right? Pretty awesome. I think it takes some faith to trust that Jesus can, can move you from point A to point B without any means of conveyance that we know of. And so he, he, he says to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now on this particular mountainside, this particular part of the, of, of the Sea of Galilee, this is, a, this is a, uh, uh, a rural area. There's not a town nearby. There's not a, there's not a place to buy food. Um, the men and women cannot buy and because no, there's nobody to sell. Listen to what I'm trying to share with you this morning. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. There may be a point where following Jesus, you're not able to buy because there's no one that will sell to you. Does that make sense? When you follow Jesus, you might be out of the way a little bit. You may be out away from the towns. You may be out from the cities. There may come a point where you're following Jesus like this great multitude and there's no bread to buy. And so we asked Philip, where, sh where should we send these people so they might, or where can we buy some bread that they may eat? And listen to Philip's response. He says, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. How much is a denarii? Anybody know? It's basically, in the first century, it's equivalent to a one day's wage. So imagine whatever it is you make in a day. That's how much a denarii is. So 200 is 200 days wages. Now, if you make 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars, that's 200 days on 365 that's over, if, it's, if you make $80,000, that's over $40,000 or, or close to it, right? More, more, it's over $40,000. That's a lot of bread, isn't it? How much could you buy with $40,000 worth of, worth of uh, money to buy bread? How, much, how, how far would that go? 
That would be a lot of bread, right? Uh, well, I don't think Pastor Art is here. He's in the uh, Spanish sanctuary, but I'm sure his bread ministry would love a donation of $40,000, right? But think about it like this. The Bible says, Philip surveys the crowd and he says, listen, you know, 40 four plus $5,000 in our terms is not enough. And what does he say? It's not enough so that every one of them may have just a little. How many of you guys agree with me that communion bread is too small? Too small. And it's a little too dry to get that one cup to get it down, right? It's a, that's a challenge, right? And Philip is saying, listen, even if we used all this fortune, by the way, I, I wonder, why does Philip say 200 denarii? I mean, that seems like a number just out of, the, out of the clouds. I think maybe it's possible that the purse that Judas carried had about that amount of money in it. And the disciples knew about how much money they had. And he said, if we take the money that we have, which is 200 days wages, if we took all this money and invested in some bread, it would just be a morsel for everybody gathered here today. And listen to what the Bible says. And then in verse 6, we'll come back to it. It says, but he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. You know, sometimes, brothers and sisters, God brings us to a point, and he asks us a question so that we can, we can come to terms with our lack of understanding. Is that fair? Philip's best suggestion in that moment was, even if we used every dollar we have, it's, it's not enough. But doesn't the Bible say God's ways are higher than our ways? Doesn't the Bible say that God's thoughts are better than our thoughts? How many of you today feel like you don't have enough? How many of you today feel like if you were to use every dollar you had, it's not going to do the job that stands before you? How many of you are looking at something in regard to your health, and you don't feel like your insurance and your, your, what you have is enough? How many of you, are like me, are trying to buy a home, and you're, you're looking at what you have to buy with, and you're looking at the cost of housing, and you're like, ah, uh, <laughs> Tria, we're going to have a beautiful shack. <laughs> right? How many, of you, how many of you are doing the math in your life and you feel like what you have is not enough? Well, that's what Philip is saying. Philip's saying, if we use every dollar we have, every dime, every denarii we have, it's not enough. But God already knew what he was going to do. And then one another disciple, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Have you ever thought, how does Andrew know that there's a little boy with a lunch with five barley loaves? Now listen, it doesn't just say a lunch. It says five barley loaves. Not just five loaves, like he glanced in the bag. He knows what kind of bread it is. He knows how many there are. Andrew sounds hungry to me. Five barley loaves. And then, remember, Andrew and Simon were, were fishermen with their father. And he says, and two small fish. If, if he were fishing, he would throw these ones back. There's five barley loaves, and you should know that barley loaves are the, it's the bread for the poor. Barley was not uh, a bread for the rich people in Jesus' day. If, if you used barley to make your bread, that means you were very poor. So there's a poor kid here with a, with a meager lunch of five barley loaves and two, the Bible says it's not fish, two what? Small fish. Two small fish. You know, when I was a kid, I was going to an Adventist school in Utah, and I won't mention it because maybe somebody will make the connection, and I don't want you to think back to what, that, what uh, administrator this could have been. But our principal, we would catch him eating the kids' lunches in the hallway. He would routinely eat the kids' lunches. Now, mind you, he never ate my lunch because I'd have peanut butter and pickle. I'd have mayonnaise, something else, and peanut butter. I mean, he never touched my lunch. My lunch was safe. But if kids had Doritos and kids had like fancy lunches, man, he was eating their lunches. And, and the kids would go back to their parents and say, the, Mr. Someone is eating my lunch. And, they, and the board actually had to talk to the principal. And the principal said, no, the kids leave their lunches in the hallway. And rather than let the food go bad, I just eat their old lunches. And they're like, those aren't old lunches. <laughs> they were made this morning. Anyhow. Do you think Andrew shook down a little kid to eat his lunch? <laughs> How did Andrew get this lunch? I'd like to suggest that God was already working in this story, amen? And there was a little boy whose mom lovingly packed him a lunch and sent him off to find Jesus. And by the way, I don't know how much little boys can eat, but I know my son, 
Um, he's not going to eat five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless this is a stout boy that has a healthy appetite, that's a lot of food for just a little boy, right? I think the mother packed him, maybe, maybe because it was a journey, maybe it was multiple days, but what he had that day was five loaves and two small fish. He, he gave it to Andrew, and I bet he gave it to Andrew so that Andrew could give it to Jesus. And, Jesus, and Andrew comes to Jesus and says, hey, there's a little boy here. By the way, isn't this nice? The disciples have learned that Jesus wants to hear from little kids now. He's not afraid to bring a little boy and his lunch to Jesus. They realize the importance of who Christ is. By the way, I know that if you feel like church went a little long or it might go a little long, mind you, we put our kids first and foremost, amen? Let's learn the lesson that we can learn from the Bible. And the Bible says, this is what the Bible says. It says, now Jesus said, make the people sit down. Philip said, all the money we have is not enough. Andrew says, here's five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they? It's not enough, Lord. We, what we have is not enough. We don't have enough money and we don't have enough food. Have you ever felt like you don't have enough money and you don't have enough food? You don't have enough money for food? How many of you guys have doubled your, uh, your grocery budget in the last year? <laughs> and I, I mean, I'd like to believe it's because we're not eating more. I think it's just the cost of food, right? The Bible continues. It says, so when they, okay, the Bible says in verse 10, then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. You know, you probably know this story as the feeding of the 5,000, but that's not accurate. It's the feeding of approximately 5,000 men and their wives and their kids. Does that make sense? The men who sat down were 5,000 number. That means whichever disciple Jesus said, hey, I need you to count who's here. He was like, I'm just going to count the men. <laughs> right? And he went through and he counted the men. He didn't count the women and the children. Not that they don't count. They do count. But it was such a huge multitude, it was impossible to do that afternoon. And so five barley loaves and two small fish, the people sitting down. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those who are sitting down. Do you see how this works? The people who want to hear from Jesus are gathered. Among that group is a meager offering of one lunch, five loaves and two small fish, Right? They give what they have, as, as meager an offering as it is, they give it to the church, represented by Philip in this case. Philip, Philip could have eaten that lunch behind a rock, and no one would have known. He could have come out and been like, what are we talking about? He could have eaten those five barley loaves and those two fish, and this story wouldn't be in the Bible. But as a representative of the church, he faithfully took the offering given, and then brought it to the Lord to see what should happen with it. Amen? And the church needs to be faithful in the tithes and the offerings it receives. We need to pray over it and bring it to the Lord and carefully consider what we do with what the church gives. And that's exactly what happens here. Philip faithfully takes it to Jesus. Jesus takes it in his hands and begins to praise over it and he begins to distribute it. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Whatever you have in your hands, it's not enough. Whatever you have in your heart, it's not enough. Whatever you have in your bank account, it's not enough. It will never be enough as long as you have it. But when you commit it to the Lord, when you agree that everything you have is better placed in Jesus' hands, then watch out. Because the world's about to be blessed. Amen? Now, don't get me wrong. Someone's like, is Pastor Ben trying to shake us down and take all our money? Nope. <laughs> nope. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches a faithful tithe and a, and a generous offering. Amen. But I'd like to suggest to you that if, if you just have a little bit of faith, make sure you put it in Jesus. If you have just a little bit to give, make sure you put it in Jesus' hands. Amen. If whatever it is, if you just have a little bit of patience, give it to Jesus and let him stretch it out. Amen. Dear ones, when you're about to yell at your kids, go run into your bedroom and say, Lord, I'm about to yell. My patience has run out. I'm going to give you the drop I have left that got me to in this room to pray and God will stretch it some more. Amen. And Jesus said, make the people sit down. He prayed over it, started to distribute. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. See how this works? The blessings are given in offerings. They come through the church to the Lord. The Lord redistributes them to the church to distribute 
to the congregation, and he multiplies it, and everyone's blessed. Amen? Watch what happens. The Bible says that the disciples to those who are sitting down, and likewise the fish, as much as they needed or they wanted. Does God give you what you need? Yeah, the Bible does say that God will promise to give you what you need, that you will not go without, that your bread and water will be sure. That is a fact. But that's not what this story says. The story doesn't say God gave them just what they needed. Have you ever eaten with somebody who watches how much you eat? It can be a little irritating. My brother, I don't know, maybe it's because he's the youngest, we'd be eating pizza, and he would always do the math, and if you reached for another slice, he's like, no! <laughs> You've had your share, Right? Brothers and sisters, the Bible says right here that, they, that he distributed the food and the, the, the bread and the fish as much as they what? Wanted. God gave them as much as they wanted, meaning if someone ate two loaves, great. If someone wanted to eat three, that's fine. If someone ate two fish, that's fine. God gave them as much as they wanted. God didn't just give them as much as they needed. God gave them as much as they what? Wanted. What kind of God does that? our God. I like that. A generous God, a loving God, a bountiful God. Brothers and sisters, when you put your faith in Jesus' hands, when you put your, your, your living in Jesus' hands, God doesn't just restore it to you or return it to you in, in drops. I remember one time my grandmother, she lived to be 98. She was a wonderful woman, but she was a pill. And I used to say, Grandma, can I just have a drop more of milk? I loved milk as a kid, and I wanted another glass of milk, but I knew I, I couldn't ask for another glass. My grandmother wouldn't give it to me, so I would put it poetically, Grandma, could I just have one more drop of milk? And so she'd go to the medicine cabinet, and this only happened once. She got a dropper, she got the milk, and she gave me one more drop. Is that how God is? If you say, hey, God, I, I just need, you know, uh, I need, I need just, just, this, just a little bit more. And God's like, take as much as you want. Brothers and sisters, you have not because you ask not. Let me ask you a question. Who is the bread of life? We're going to learn this in a, couple, in, a, in a subsequent sermon. But just as a preview, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus takes those hands, which will be near. By the way, how many of you love Nancy's song? Amen? Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Perfect song for this sermon. Those same soon-to-be nail-scarred hands started distributing the bread. And when the bread, by the way, was the bread given in whole loaves or did it have to be broken first? In order for the people to receive the bread that comes from Jesus, it has to be broken first. In order for Jesus to, to give the people what they need, there had to be a breaking, a tearing. There had to be something had to break in order for the people to be blessed. And the Bible says... So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments, not gather up the loaves, not gather up the small fish, gather up the fragments. Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. And watch this. If you've ever been a minister, if you've ever been a deacon or a disciple, or if you've ever worked for the church, or you've ever been a missionary, and you're not sure you're gonna, your budget's going gonna, to, you're going to be able to make ends meet, listen to this, disciples of Christ. The Bible says, therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Now, get this. How many disciples are there? Primary disciples? 12. How many baskets are gathered up? 12. If Philip, the church, were to take those five barley loaves and those fish, hide behind a rock and eat them, one disciple of Christ would have been fed among that multitude. But the church believed in Jesus. And the church faithfully brought the offering to the Lord to determine what to do with it. And then when God said, have them sit down. And then when God said, you know, you first, you serve first. You don't eat first, disciples. You serve first. Church family, you're the disciples of Christ. Amen. When you're in the world and you're dealing with people who don't yet know Jesus or coming to him for the first time, you don't put yourself first. We don't put our pastors on a pedestal and feed them first. If you ever see me go through a line in uh, uh, even a luncheon, I will go nearly always dead last. Why? First, I love to talk to people, and that's one of the best days to do it. Amen? But second, the principle is the disciples of Christ, the servants of Christ, they, they get their blessing after having served. Amen? 
And then there's a basket of blessing for them. Brothers and sisters, the Lord knows I don't miss a meal. When we gather together, it's okay if I eat last. <laughs> so when, the, when, the, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. God is telling the would-be followers of him, the would-be disciples, the would-be pastors, the would-be ministers, the would-be administrators, that after you do your job and you listen to me and obey my words, there will be a bountiful blessing for you. It'll always be enough for your family. Amen? The Bible says in verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, the men, this is speaking of the 5,000, this is truly the prophet, what? This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, you would need to understand a little bit about the Jewish nation and about the promises God made to them, so we need to go back to Deuteronomy to understand this reference. Those 5,000 men, after they'd eaten, and I'm sure people were saying, hey, this is, let's call him Caleb. This is Caleb's lunch. I recognize this bread. This is Caleb's mom's barley bread. I, I don't know what it was, but they recognized that there was no food, there was no place to buy, there was no place to sell, and God fed everybody the multitude with one meager lunch. Repeat after me. I may not have much, but if what I have, I put in the hands of Jesus, it's more than enough. If your faith is small, put it in the hands, put it in Jesus. It'll be more than enough for the steps ahead. If your finances are small, Put it in, under the control of Jesus. Give it to Jesus, and it'll be more than enough for the life he has planned for you. If Whatever it is, if your health is small, give it to God, amen? If you can barely draw breath, determine in your heart, I live for the glory of God, and I'm going to give my life to Jesus, and see if he doesn't stretch it. See if he doesn't make you a servant past your time and past your prime. Deuteronomy chapter, let's go back to 18. And let's look at verse 15. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Bible says in verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. They're there before the... Uh, the, the um, this is remember, this reminding them of the time they were there in Mount Sinai. And the Bible says, Moses says to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this, this great fire anymore, lest I die. You see, this same people, now some generations ago, back down to the days of Moses, not in the days of Christ, this same people met with God on a mountain a long time ago. But when God met with them on the mountain, the mountain was on fire and there was smoke and there were, there were ropes around the mountain saying, don't touch or you will die. And even just the voice of God coming from the mountain was so, so frightening, the people said, Moses, we need you to go talk to God and tell us what he said. We are afraid we're going to die just by hearing his voice. Right? And God says to Moses, tell them that one day I'll raise up a prophet who will, like you, meaning it's, they're going to receive you, that your voice is not going to Put the, put the fear of God in them necessarily quite as much. I'll raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them that I, all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet he presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak or he who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Basically, God is saying, in the future, I'm going to raise up a very special prophet. I'm going to put my words in him, and he will speak only that which I tell him to speak. Didn't Jesus just get done telling us that in John? I do whatever my father does. I say whatever my father says. Jesus will not leave the script that his father gave him. Amen? And so the question is, well, who is this prophet that they speak of back here in John? This, who is the prophet in Deuteronomy? Well, the Bible says here in John chapter 6, <clears throat> the 5,000 men reason among themselves, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Remember just a few chapters ago, remember the scribes and the Pharisees sent uh, uh, ambassadors to John the Baptist and they asked him, are you the prophet? Was John the Baptist a prophet? Yes, but was he the prophet? They were referring to the prophet in Deuteronomy. He, wasn't, he says, no, I'm not. I'm not 
I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the prophet. Well, wouldn't you like to know definitively who the prophet was? Don't you think if it's important, the Bible will tell you? Come with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and verse 17. This is Peter now speaking to, um, speaking in, in, in Jerusalem, in Solomon's portico. In verse 17 it says, Yet now, brethren, Acts chapter 3, verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers, speaking of killing Christ, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before. Who preached Jesus Christ before? Moses. Who has preached to you before in the times of restoration of all things. And, oh, pardon me, in whom, in whom heaven must receive. Did heaven receive Jesus? Yes. Until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And then verse 22, listen to this without a shadow of a doubt. If someone suggests that the prophet in Deuteronomy is not Jesus Christ, take him to this verse. Acts 3, verse 22. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God, this is a quote from Deuteronomy, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, whom you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you, and it shall be that who, every soul who will not hear that prophet shall utterly be destroyed from among the people. So who does Peter believe that prophet of Deuteronomy is? Jesus. Come back to John chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, we need to listen to Jesus. <laughs> we need to learn from Jesus. We need to agree with the people there, those 5,000 men, that Jesus is the prophet whom God will send, that his words will be the very words of God. And in this message, what you and I can take from it, and one thing we can take from it, is that no matter how little you have to give to God, if you give it to him and it's in his hands, when he thanks God for that gift and he begins to multiply it, a multitude of people will be blessed because of that gift. You know, when I was there on that concourse and we were upgraded to first class, it never happened before. And already I felt like, well, this is new. This is a special trip. We got on the plane, we boarded the plane, and you know, first class passengers, they board first. There's no, there's no cattle call, there's no fighting for space. I was like, Tria, look, this bin is empty. What do we do with all this space? And we sat down and the lady's like, would you like a towel? What for? <laughs> You know, oh, thank you, thank you, you know. And we're sitting down, and this very prestigious businessman sat. I'm on the aisle, tree is in the middle. I, I feel like there was only two chairs there in the first class. It's, and they're nice, they're big. And there's two chairs side by side, and, you know, we're enjoying the refreshments. And this man sits beside, beside us in this really nice suit. We're in, like, street clothes. And uh, this man turns to me, and he says, I perceive you are a pastor. What gave me away? <laughs> Actually, I told him, not, not quite, sir. He goes, he goes, no, you've studied to be a pastor, and you are traveling to Florida for an interview. And I'm like, I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and the man says, you're traveling to, to Florida for an interview. In fact, not just one interview, but you have three interviews set up. And I did. I was supposed to interview in Port Charlotte, interview in Jacksonville, and interview in Gainesville. And the guy goes, just so you know, and I said, I actually, I said to him, I said, sir, how do you know this? And the man said, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Of course I do. Well, the Holy Spirit's telling me to tell you this. I'm sitting in an, in an airport worried about a job. I've, I've, I've given six years of my life to studying and I'm, I'm, it's 2008, I think the economy is so bad that they're going to cut me out and I'm going to do something else with my life. And before I even get to the interview, God wants me to know I am in the center of his plan for my life. And this man says, you have been studying, you have three interviews, and I want to tell you what's going to happen in those interviews. He goes, it's actually, it's only one interview that you're going to actually go. The very first church you interview at, you're going to accept the position, they're going to offer it to you, you're going to accept the position, and it's going to be a wonderful period of ministry in your life. You'll never even interview at the other two churches. 
And I came down here, and I was in the hallway, and was in the Grand Hall 10, 11 years ago. No, it was more than that. It was 14, 15 years ago. And Shree and I are shaking in our boots. We're these kids straight out of the seminary, and we're so excited but so nervous. And we have this interview, and that night, Tim Goff took us to a restaurant that doesn't even exist in Charlotte County anymore, Crisper's. And we're at Crisper's, and, and Tim, you know, Tim in his own quirky way, he's smiling, his big smile, takes us out to dinner, and he goes, so what do you think? Did you, what do you think about the interview? And I'm like, I, I, they didn't tell me if I got the job. I didn't know. And our server was super nice, and I was friendly with the server and got to know his name. And, and I told Tim, I was like, Tim, somebody should study with that guy. He's open to learning about who Jesus is. And Tim goes, oh, how about you study with him? And I'm like, and he smiled. And I'm like, what are you saying, Tim? Well, why don't you study with him? I'm like, well, are are you saying I got the job? He's like, you got the job, Ben. (laughs) Everything that man said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on the plane that day has happened exactly the way he said it. And that's happened twice in my life. That was the first time. There was another time. Brothers and sisters, what am I saying? I had a little bit of faith in God. Not enough faith to take the next 10 steps, just enough faith to take the next step. And I gave my faith to God. We bought the ticket. We, we, were, we were moving forward in faith. And God was like, it's time to stretch your faith, Ben. I'm going to introduce you to the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. By the way, wouldn't you like to know a little bit more about that businessman? He was from India. And he was a Pentecostal. He wasn't Seventh-day Adventist at all. But he was a Pentecostal and he spoke the words of God in my life. Pretty cool, right? My brothers and my sisters, God has a plan for your life. Do you believe that? God has a plan for your life. And if you say to me today, Ben, I don't have enough of this. I don't have enough of that. I'm going to tell you right now what to do with what you got. Put it in Jesus' hands. Put it in Jesus' hands because he will stretch it and he'll make it a blessing for multitudes to come. How many of you believe a little bit more in Jesus Christ as a result of hearing that testimony about that plane ride? Amen? So you mean to tell me that God gave me a story to strengthen my faith and it strengthened your faith? So he took Ben's meager faith lunch and (laughs) prayed over it, and it's been a blessing to all who've heard it since. My brothers and my sisters, whatever it is for you, if it's finances, if it's your relationships, if it's your, I don't know what it is, if it's your health, put it in Jesus' hands and let him bless it. Let him multiply it. And it'll come back to you after it blesses the people in ways which are bountiful, a basket full of blessings. How many of you today, the sermon's touching your heart and you're saying, Pastor Ben, I need that. I came. God sent me here to hear this sermon and and I need that. I'm going to invite you to come forward. Only you know what's so meager. Only you know what's so little. But you want to give what you got to God and you want to put it in His hands. And by coming forward, if you're willing to come forward, you're, you're being like the, the little boy who went, came forward and said to Philip, Philip, could you take this lunch to Jesus? And instead of Philip eating that lunch, he brought it to Jesus, and Jesus did so much. Come on up, come on up. Not everybody has to come up, but if you feel like there's a lack in your life, and you want to give that portion of your life that is lacking to Jesus, he's going to expand on it, amen? Someone says, Pastor Ben, it's a long service. You said we're going to stop at 12.30, but... Are you okay with the Spirit moving a little more? Are you okay with your brothers and sisters who obviously have a lack in their life and they're worried they won't be able to make ends meet relationally, financially, in some regard? They won't, they're worried they don't have enough. Listen, Tree and I, we've saved up a little bit and we're worried. Our, uh, Tree, stand up here with me because I'm not, I'm not sure what we've saved up is enough to buy the house we need, Amen. So I'm standing with you because I'm putting it in Jesus' hands because it's not going to be my house. It's going to be whose house? It's going to be God's house. And I hope that many, many of you are blessed by that home one day soon. Dear ones, you can see the the sanctuary is filling up. If you feel impressed to come forward, that's fine if you want to stand right where you're at. But I'm going to pray for you. Do you believe, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God loves the first century crowd that day more than he loves the 21st century crowd today? Do you believe that he has more compassion on the people who were sitting down on the grass that day than he does on you who were sitting down on these green grassy pews? <laughs> the Bible tells us, just in case you're wondering, the Bible tells us God is no respecter of persons. And he loves you with an everlasting love. 
And if you learn the lesson of this little boy, if you learn the lesson of the disciples, and we give what you got to Jesus, he's just been waiting for you to trust him so he can work a miracle in your life. I'm going to pray for you. Let's pray. Well, loving Heavenly Father, Lord, today it's been such a blessing. We have seen beautiful children uh, be, be, be recognized for their hard work this last year. We've seen Judith give her life to Jesus. Amen? And Lord, now we see these folks gathered in the sanctuary who recognize in some respect, and I don't know, I don't have the wisdom, but your Holy Spirit can read hearts and minds, and you know just why they stood up. You know just why they came forward. And Lord, just like that little boy made sure that his lunch landed in the hands of Jesus, just like Philip made sure that he wasn't selfish, but passed it on to give it to the master. Lord, these individuals are giving what they've got, even if it's a little bit, even if it's surely not enough. What is this for the need in front of me? Lord, we're going to learn from this lesson and we're going to put what we have, our faith, our finances, our health, our families, our strength, as little as they may be, we're going to put them in your hands and Lord, won't you pray over them right now? Not my prayer, Lord, but your prayer. Won't you, won't you because of the broken, your broken body on the cross, won't you, since you bought us, since you purchased at great cost to heaven, won't you do what you, what you paid for? And that is to bless the earth again. That is to restore all things. That is to cover your people with your provision and with your protection. Lord, we're not going to fight you on this. We're not going to tell you how to do what you do but we want to we want to sit down and be obedient and watch you work in these areas. Lord, we're either the little boy with the little lunch, the disciple distributing, we're somewhere in this story or maybe we're both at the same time. Father, bless us. May there be a basket full of blessing as a result of this day, as a result of this prayer, as a result of this ser this sermon. I love you, I trust you. Do for these people what you did for the multitude that day. In Jesus' name, amen.